And welcome to our time. Based in London, Wayne Harrison is a director and creative producer working internationally. As director of and CEO of the Sydney Theatre Company, he directed over 40 productions. He's been creative director of SFX, Back Row and Clear Channel Entertainment in Europe, part of the producing team behind Gumboots, Tap Dogs, Slava's Snow Show, Fosse and Mum's World and has directed many other productions around the world. Wayne's recent directing credits also include Human Nature, The Motown Show at the Venetian in Las Vegas, the production of Absinthe in Caesar's Palace, Las Vegas, which Wayne directed and co-wrote and celebrates its 12th anniversary soon, and it was recently named number one greatest show in Las Vegas history. Wayne was the creative director of the New Year's Eve celebrations in Sydney Harbour and the closing ceremony for Melbourne's Commonwealth Games. Is there any show this man hasn't directed or produced? Yes, this one, because he's the subject of this episode for a change. Welcome, Wayne. Thank you, Mark. That's the longest introduction I think I've done for anybody. What an amazing body of work. And that's just scratching the surface of your background. Uh, yes. So it's a bit of a naive question, I suppose, but how did you become such an international producer-director? Um. Well, uh, it's a little bit to do with uh, my mother, mm -hmm. who was a, a Tivoli showgirl or a right. soubrette, as Sabrina. she was. Uh, yes, and she did the presenting on. I wonder if anybody stage knows what soubrette means anymore. Well, yes, they were the person who did that and then took the um, uh, the rabbit when the magician pulled it out of the hat. They were the one who took it away, <laughs> and um, uh, and uh, so I got a lot of. Uh, theatre stories from her when I was a child and um, she took me to a dance school where I became a, uh, a, a tap dancer right? and won a few championships and then ended up as a child performer for J.C. Williamson's in their pantomimes and their musicals, Noel Coward, Sail Away and Camelot. And in Melbourne, mostly in Melbourne. They had a Majesty's Theatre well. in Melbourne, yep. they were. And uh, then I moved into television and became a, uh, a singer and dancer with a group of other, uh, uh, with four other um, teenage uh, boys. And we were called the Happy Olivettes and we performed on Happy Hammond's The Happy oh, Show. I've just read mm. his book. Oh, really? Yes. And it's really interesting. Now I have to go back and see if there's some pictures of you because there oh, probably is. There probably might be. <laughs> Well, for those South Australians, Happy Hammond was it was the show. Here in Adelaide, we had, on Channel 9, we had uh, the Channel Niners, which was sort of the kids' show that everyone was on. But in Melbourne, it was Happy Hammond. It was Happy Hammond. Right with, from the beginning of TV, wasn't it? Yes, with Princess Panda and um, yes. Sylvester the Talking Sock. And, <laughs> <laughs> and us, the Happy Olivet, singing and dancing... Um, uh, songs that probably were not right for children coming home from school to watch at five o'clock on well, a weekday. <laughs> well, but the truth was, though, that in that time, because we're talking 50s, early 60s? Yeah, uh, yes, into the early 60s, But yes. in that time, pop singers weren't so famous. It was more the Doris Days and those sort of people at that time yes. that had the hit records. Perry yes. Como, I'm showing my age now. Yes, but singing um, by the light of the silvery moon might have been a little bit too much for well, kids who'd I mean, had a hard yeah. day at primary school. But um, well, we did it. Well, would have listened to it, so they would have been familiar with it, I guess. <laughs> I know we tried to mix it up a bit, and, and there was a big hit, I think, in the early 60s called Alley Cat, which was, um, she goes on yeah. the prowl each night like an alley cat. And that, that's when the Channel 7 switchboard just e exploded <laughs> because um, the mums and dads didn't want their kids hearing songs about prostitutes. To be alley cats. On, yeah, no, so, um, on, on a kid's show. Uh, so, yeah, and I just, I um, went to university for a while and um, uh, didn't like it very much. So uh, then I ended up working as a, Chorus boy for J.C. Williamson's um, through the great so, Betty but Pounder. But there's quite a jump from being a chorus boy to being an international producer. That's true. And it, uh, when I went to university for the second time and met a man called Philip Parsons who ran a, a course called The Play and Performance at the University of New South Wales. They had a, a school there of drama, very much like the, 
the um, drama school of Flinders University, you mm -hmm. know, which Walt Cherry set which up. Which is why you're in Adelaide at the moment, of course. Yes, it is, indeed, um, to work at uh, Flinders University and the School of Drama. But um, uh, Philip uh, uh, taught me how to be a play doctor, a dramaturg, a literary manager, and uh, then I became the literary manager of the Sydney Theatre Company just after it had been set up uh, in the early 80s. And, uh, and Richard Werrett, who ran the company, encouraged me to be a director. And then I became a full-time director and an artistic director and ran the Sydney Theatre Company for nine years, uh, producing and directing. And then I just graduated from there to, uh, after Sydney Theatre Company, to London. We recently had Mitchell Battelle on the show, who, yes. who is now here in South Australia doing exactly that, yes. who spoke very highly of you. Oh, well, I can speak very highly of him too. He was in a couple of shows for me. And, yes. And as, um, as then for said, Barry fact, Kosky at the Sydney Theatre We Company. actually showed, I think, some of, the, some of the bits, photos from some of those shows. Right. Well, yes. So from Australia, how do you jump internationally? Well, I got invited. Uh, you, you find that when you run a state theatre company and... Uh, you make a lot of friends, but you make a lot of enemies as well. And I fought a very um, uh, uh, severe battle with the state government there about, uh, I don't know whether you um, have been to the Sydney Theatre Company's wharf in Walsh Bay, which is a fantastic construct. Well, that was under threat to being a, you know, a, a change as the developers moved in around there. And I, I fought a fairly heated battle to keep the theatre company as it was, and, in, and I won. But you do make a few, um, um, not enemies, but, uh, you know, people... You just know that when you leave... Yeah, after you've run a state theatre company for nearly 10 years, you just know the phone's not going to ring if you um, <laughs> sit back at home and wait for it. So yeah, I decided well. that I would leave on my own terms, and, and, um, and it was uh, actually Peter Holmes, a courts company, uh, back row, run by Liz Coops and Gary McQuinn, who lured me to London, and I set up shop with them. And uh, as your introduction said, we... Uh, uh, did a lot of uh, commercial uh, touring throughout the UK and Europe and in America uh, with shows like Tap Dogs and Gumboots and uh, Mum's the Word and that and uh, it was hugely successful. Well Tap Dogs certainly changed, for men, it changed really the style of dance and put men back on the, um, I was going to say calendar, that's the wrong thing, back on the horizon I suppose as being dancers. Yes. Because so often people forget that men can dance as well as women. That is true. And, uh, yes, uh, uh, as luck would have it, you know, Dean Perry came to me at the Sydney Theatre Company to pitch this show because I was uh, taking over another part of the Sydney Theatre Company's uh, wharf and turning it into a 700-seat nightclub, as you do. Of course. And, uh, what do you um, do with uh, an old wharf, yeah. really? And I had stomp coming out. Remember Stomp yes, the Percussion do, yeah. hit from the 90s and, um, and the unions kind of said, well, that's okay for a state theatre company to do that as long as you create a local show to go with oh, it. Oh, really? And, okay. um, and then uh, Dean happened into my office. He said, well, look, I'm, I'm really not sure why I'm here. I'm pitching a tap dancing show to somebody running a state theatre company. And I said, well, I used to be a champion tap dancer, so you've come to the, exactly the right place. And that's how um, the chemistry started for Tap Dogs. But I, I yeah. really loved it because he was doing um, something that you said. He was, um, you know, telling a narrative about uh, boys in, in Newcastle, New South Wales, who um, instead of playing pool together or, you know, getting off their face on drink or drugs or that, they actually tap dance. And mm. this, this idea really appealed to me and that's how it kind of... And 25 years later, it, just before COVID, it was still touring the world, you know, which is... Amazing. And an amazing show because I've seen it. The, I think the issue with that, though, is it's mums and dads and perhaps dads who don't think it's a male thing to do to be able to dance. But our culture is one of the few that doesn't have dance as a fundamental of storytelling. If we look at First Nation people... Yes. It's mostly men who actually dance and hand over the stories. It's a shame that we've lost that, really. That is true. Well, I, when I was a young tap dancer, there was a lot of resistance from the fathers yes. in our group. I think there who, still is. Actually. Who didn't want their sons um, uh, uh, tap dancing. They were OK if we tap danced 
like Gene Kelly. If we tap dance like Fred Astaire, they got really worried. <laughs> they didn't that, want that But at that's all. interesting you should make that difference between the two men who danced because there was genuinely a difference between the oh, two yes. men. And it was almost like, you know, in that 10-year period it was the Fred Astaire style and then in that 10-year period it was the Gene Kelly stronger butcher. That's right. You dance through the knees and, and through the lower part of the body rather than doing the big yes, balletic stuff the balletic that um, Fred Astaire did. And, uh, Which but, was more, more or less a ballroom style, wasn't it? It was, That, that he indeed. could tap into. Yeah. Yes, and uh, the, the, the fathers did feel much happier doing um, the, or with us doing the, um, the Gene Kelly stuff than the Fred Astaire. Right, no, I yes. completely understand that. Yeah. So um, this show that you've got in Las Vegas... Absinthe. Absinthe, yes. I want to hear a lot more about that. And we'll be back to discuss that with Wayne in just a tick. A special guest on this episode of Our Time is Wayne Harrison. We're just about to talk about this amazing show you've got in Vegas. Yes. At 12 years is a long time for a Vegas show to run. Yes. And where is it? It's, um, it's in a very large tent mm -hmm. out front of Caesar's Palace. Well, we're familiar with uh, the Spiegel tent here in Australia. Yes. But it's bigger than that, isn't it? It is bigger it's than that. It's bigger than it that. did start in a, uh, a oh, Spiegel tent, yes, in uh, New York, down at the South Street Seaport, uh, which is Goodness. in Lower Manhattan um, yeah. in the shadow of the Brooklyn Bridge. Right. And for three years... Um, we did a summer show there on the pier or the wharf there in a the bigger tent. And um, from that came, after the financial crash and everything, came an interest from Caesars Palace in doing a version of that show there, which we originally did in a regulation Spiegel tent. Right. And then um, we created a... A, a bigger Vegas, one because it had Vegas. to be about a little bit more money than than a small Spiegel tent could actually um, uh, contribute to our funds. It looks amazing, but how? So just talk about the show a bit. So if anyone's going to Vegas, they can maybe check it out. Yes. Well, it was originally the idea of uh, the producer Ross Mollison, um, who calls himself the uh, impresario extraordinaire, and uh, but he had the Original idea for... I think that should be your title. <laughs> no, no, I'm prepared to let him be the okay. producer. I'll just take the writing and the um, directing credits. Okay. And uh, I'm always good with reflected glory. I quite like that. Um, the point is, all show business really is a team effort. Even a one-man oh, show. Is. There's yeah. no such thing as a one-person show. It's a collaboration Absolutely. of uh, all, all the people that... It, um, yes, even the audiences are the ones who actually help you make it happen make it happen and help you tell the story even of Romeo and Juliet and that you know that that is an Elizabethan uh, thing do you think uh, it really the audience contribution we're all breathing the same air at the same time with the live show yeah it's only ever going to be that way once and so seeing a live show you're actually in a unique situation of seeing something that's a once only even yes. though the show might have been running for 12 years yes. how many shows a week do they do if I told you 16 yes, of I'd Absinthe, believe I'd believe that. Uh, we have several casts yep. and they rotate and there are many different versions of the show. Oh, okay. But it, it goes, um, yeah, three shows on a, on a uh, Friday and Saturday and then two shows every other day of the week. And it, uh, You'd need a revolving cast with that. You do, yes, <laughs> yes. to accommodate it. Uh, yes, but Ross had the original idea to create um, not just a variety show, but uh, one that had a, a slight storyline that went through it and, and the basic storyline is that, um, uh, you know, some, a man takes a sip of absinthe and then weird things happen, including uh, the appearance of this man called the gazillionaire who claims to be the producer of the whole thing and, um, and then provides wacky entertainment for the, for the next 80 minutes. And... Uh, <laughs> Yes, yeah, so Ross sent me to Vegas originally when we were to do it there and, and I lived there for a period of time just to, to kind of get the feel of the place the and, 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 and yes, the heat and uh, who, who the audience was actually going to be for this sort of show and how we could... Uh, is, it, is it an international audience? Is it people from everywhere that... 
Uh, Pre-COVID, it certainly Pre -COVID, was. It's, sure. it's been a little bit uh, less so. international uh, since then, but it's bu it's building. It's Once now, I believe, around you know about seventy percent of what it was pre-COVID, and right. it's, and they had like four million visitations to Vegas last month. So you can see it's. it's Would well, it be a language brilliant. thing too? I guess because there's people from literally everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, and we do uh, a lot of visual entertainment. Yeah. You know, we do a visual variety show. Really, but that, but that there, in in essence, is the director's job to make it, you know, universal. I suppose in what's happening. Yes. Was that difficult? Uh, no, I had uh, quite a bit of ex experience uh, of it. I mean. Uh, the, one of the reasons why Tap Dogs has been a success for 25 years is because you can take it to any country in the world and the feet do the talking, yep. the tap, the music and the rhythms and everything do the talking. Yep. You, you're not, you don't have to translate it into languages, yep. you don't have to have surtitles. That, and um, you kind of uh, do that with shows in Vegas too. You, uh, with... Um, uh, uh, Absinthe, we, we trade on what we call the four S's, which are skill, that all the acrobats and the, and the performers in it have skill. Uh, they have sex appeal, <laughs> not sex on stage, but they have... Uh, <laughs> you can they have that in some way, surely. <laughs> they have sex. They strip, They some, everybody takes some clothes off at one stage, and we do insult humour, which is the play on the S in insult. Um, and, okay. and, and that, and Insulting that, each other humour? Uh, no, uh, no, the gazillionaire character actually insults the audience. Oh, I love and it. the more he insults the audience, the, the more they laugh and the more they keep coming back. And that's do you think, do you th well, with humour, humour has changed so much over the last few years that everybody's now very touchy with what they can and can't say. Yes. But when you see a show of this nature, suddenly we all get sort of jolted back to what humour used to be, I think. Yes, well, and it is in the and great sending tradition. Sending each other up is... Well, theatrical humour is exactly that. Yes, yeah, so insult humour has a great tradition um, in the variety of vaudeville the circuit and and that, and, and the gazillionaire and his offsiders actually trade on that to... Um, uh, yeah, and as I said, you can insult them even if they don't speak English. They get it <laughs> that they're being insulted. There's something about the love. rhythm, isn't there? There's something about the rhythm of even if you don't understand the language, you understand the joke and when to laugh. Yeah. When it's delivered by prose, you just know. You just know. And yeah. because, it, because the rest of the audience are laughing, yeah. you kind of go with it. And yeah. uh, that can be... Uh, uh, yeah, so, so we worked that out fairly quickly when we did the three years in New York beforehand. And... Um, uh, and it works uh, very well in Vegas. It does help that you have a kind of drunky drunk crowd that, who are, you happy know, crowd. A, a happy crowd who are out for a, you know, a good night's entertainment. Yeah. And that's why... Why go if you're not? The, true. But, uh, yeah, it, it has really... It's worked incredibly well there and now in its 12th year, and that, which is fantastic. Well, so <laughs> the other night I was at a function or at a show that you had directed here in South Australia with the Drama Centre at Flinders Uni. Yes, um, just explain what that was, because it was a very interesting collaboration of Australian works. Yes. Well, it was their graduating students, nine of them, who um, uh, have to write a, a thesis each as part of their final year. Mm -hmm. And part of the thesis uh, has as, as its basis um, uh, scenes from Australian plays uh, with the theme of coming of age. So they... Mm -hmm. The, the, the students selected the scenes from the plays which they would then write about in their thesis but which they would also perform, perform. as part of their um, There was seven final year. altogether? Nine. Nine, sorry. Nine, yes. yes. Nine students and um, all very talented. They were. Each in their own ways. Uh, Fantastic. But, but very good. I often say to people, it's actually when you get to see students like this, you actually see our taxes at work. Yes. Which mm -hmm. often the public forget. So being able to see people at the beginning of a career coming out with such strong ability. Oh, and congratulations. It was, it was actually beautifully directed. Oh, but how you. did they con you into coming over to do it? <laughs> well, I have been a friend of uh, Dr Chris Hurrell who runs the, um, or that part of the, um, uh, the school there dealing with the uh, uh, graduating students. And uh, he has worked with me on several projects over the year, including we did one in London uh, 
fairly recently for the 100th anniversary of Gallipoli and, uh, and Anzac. Uh, and we, re- we restaged a play called The One Day of the Year, oh, an yes. Alan Seymour play, which yep. is very... Uh, famous Australian play, and I think that gave him the idea then of oh, actually researching these historical plays and right. giving them to his students to go, hey, have a look through these and see if there's any scenes in them that you might like to use as part of your thesis and, um, and, identify and then an act on stage. Yeah. And what I loved about it was they all had Australian accents. <laughs> yes. Because I'm so tired of hearing other accents that don't belong to this country. Right. So seeing things that were about us. You know, I love, for example, seeing the show Priscilla when it, when it happened in Sydney for the yes. first time. And they're talking about King's Cross, which was just up the road, and with an Australian accent. You know, it was just great to hear our stories for a change instead of stories from somewhere else. I know. I, I'll, um, I've said it many times before, and I'll probably say it, uh, again, again. Uh, the, 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 um, when I first um, encountered the, the work of David Williamson in mm-hmm. the theatre and uh, I remember him saying that um, we have to tell our own stories in our own voices, mm. otherwise reality is something that happens somewhere else to someone else. And I've always followed that credo in, in the theatre. Mm. Uh, even when I moved to London, I tried... Uh, at least once a year, I wasn't totally successful, in doing an Australian play in London or in um, LA or... Well, Neighbours was so popular and they had Australian accents. Oh, look at that, yes. It's very, you know, very acceptable to hear our accent. Yes, and and they changed the way the Poms talked too, which was, (laughs) you know, because they'd never heard words like bludgers or... uh, They'd never heard a word like uni before. They all all said university and that, you know. And then suddenly everybody in um, London was saying, oh, are you going to uni? uh, Which was kind of weird. Well, we're going to take another short break and we'll be back to chat a little bit more with Wayne in just a moment. We've been chatting with Wayne Harrison about his amazing show business career as a producer, director all over the world. Wayne, what are you going to do when you grow up then? (laughs) Um, I'm not sure. I I think I'll always be a child. There's a bit of, um, you know, the man child about me. And uh, and I, I... I still uh, work a lot, but these days, uh, if I don't like the people and I don't like the ideas, then I, uh, I've got to enjoy it. Life's too short. You need yeah. to enjoy everything we do. I know, but when I um, uh, leave Adelaide this time, I'll be uh, heading to uh, Vegas to work again with uh, Human Nature on a new show at the South Point Casino. Well, we haven't talked much about that, but but that has kept them sort of at the top of their career, hasn't it? I know. They have. Uh, they made a very clever decision when they... Employed you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but before that, they made a great decision to um, leave Australia and, and try their luck on the west coast of America in LA, and then they were lucky enough to... Um, meet Smokey Robinson, the, one of the, yes. the, the, the great forces behind Motown. And he took them to Vegas. He loved them and took them to Vegas and uh, pro- produced their first show there. And that was um, you know, 12 years ago or something like that. But uh, if they had stayed here, it would have been a very difficult um, existence beyond... Of you know, They've been together 34 years yes. now. You know, yeah. And to... Um, uh, uh, to stay here, and you can only play like the, you know, the Padstow RSL clubs and and all that for so many times. We've well, only two for so long. That's yes, true. Yeah. but they played it very well because they've gone over and they've become headliners in Vegas, and now they can actually come back and 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 say and, that, and yes. and their fans who are still with them after thirty uh, years and they're worldwide, love it, yeah. and they love it that they've become headliners yeah. in in Vegas and so I, I love working with them and then beyond them I go to Vancouver to work with the Mums the Word Collective oh, who man. are a great example uh, to anybody who works in the business. They were all actors who found that when they had children, the, you know, the two years or so they had to take off to to give birth and raise their children, actually um, meant that their phones didn't ring and they were suddenly out of of the circuit. So they got together 
and uh, on a Saturday morning and did therapy writing classes with each other and wrote down all their experiences. And one of the husbands came to They're see They're telling us said, we have to go. They're telling us we have to go. Oh, no. And there's so much more to say. Wayne, I'm thank sorry. you. No, don't be sorry. Thank you I'm so much. I'm just raving on. No, no, it's just lovely to chat with you. It's, uh, we have to go. Sorry. Join us next time on our time. Thank you so much, Wayne. We will keep talking. Sadly, you won't be with us. So keep yourself nice <laughs> till we meet next time. Bye.